So when's the last time you've been to the doctor and had a physical? For some of you, it's been very recent. For some of you, a long time ago, young people sometimes have to get a physical for sports. For years, I never went to the doctor. I thought that was a great thing, you know? I don't need a doctor. I'm healthy. I'm young. <laughs> Those days are past. <clears throat> My mom's 84, and she doesn't really have a doctor. She's got a theory that uh, I've heard espoused by other people, and that is, if you go to the doctor, they're going to find something wrong. So if you don't go to the doctor, your body never knows there's something wrong with it. Uh, I guess she's great at denial, like a lot of us. But it's good to go and get a physical because if there is something wrong with your body, you kind of want to know, don't you? I mean, you do, but you don't because if you find out what's wrong, then you can go about correcting it so that you can be healthier and be better. But that can be painful because if you go and get a physical, they might want to take your blood. And they'll look at your blood to see if you've got any diseases. They'll check your vital signs, your blood pressure and pulse and all that stuff. They're probably going to tell you something about your weight. Or they might say, you've got to start taking these pills. Nah, we don't like to go through all that. Better to just ignore. But some things we, we do need to know. And some things we do need to be prepared for. Especially when something in us needs to change. This is the season of preparation, the season of Advent. It's the season that comes right before Christmas. And it's a time for a physical, a spiritual physical, a time to look within to see what's going on inside of us spiritually and to see if there's anything that needs to change. The color for this season that often is seen in the church such as the, with the candles, the purple, it's a deep purple. It's sort of a, a pensive, contemplative, looking within kind of color. That's what we're supposed to be doing in this season. We're supposed to be thinking about the fact that Christ is coming, Christ came, and we're to prepare for his coming by looking within to see if we're ready for him to come. Unfortunately, our culture tells us the way to get ready for Christmas is to make sure you bring up the tree in time, get all the decorations out, bake the cookies, buy the gifts, and all that stuff. And so often, we, we lose sight of, of what the Advent season is supposed to be for God's people. A time of looking within, a time of preparing, a time of examining within. But Jesus made it clear that he not only was arriving on earth as a baby, but he was going to come back. And in this parable, in Matthew 25, he gives us a story about some maidens or some virgins that uh, were ready for the great event, the great celebration, and some were not prepared. And it's a difficult story to understand unless you know something about Jewish culture as it pertains to weddings. It was very different than what a lot of us are used to. You see, back then, a wedding was a week-long event. And over the course of time leading up to that week, there were three stages. There was engagement, there was betrothal, and then there was the actual wedding. And this story in Matthew 25 deals with that last part, the actual wedding. And it talks about these women, and there's ten of them, and they've got lamps, and they're waiting for the groom. Like, what does that mean? Well, again, in that culture... What happened was, it was a week-long celebration, but the bride and the groom weren't always together in that celebration. And at the end, the groom would be with his family, and he'd be celebrating, and the bride would be waiting for him to come and get her and take her to their home. But you never knew when he was going to come because he's got the lampshade on his head, and you know, he's, he's celebrating with his family. So at some point, whenever that party would wind down, he would go and get his bride. He just didn't know when. So as Jesus is telling this story in that day to those people, they understood exactly what he was talking about. It was a great example for them. And these ten virgins, basically, it's the bridal party. 
and they're waiting along with the bride. And because they don't know when the groom is coming, uh, they've got lamps because the lamps were part of the celebration. When the groom would come, it would be announced, they'd get themselves together, and they'd light their lamps, and they would go dancing through the streets from the bride's home to where they were going to be living with the groom. So to not have oil in your lamp was a big deal because you couldn't really be part of the celebration. It would be like maybe today, I don't know, the bridesmaids, if they forgot their flowers, their bouquet. All the rest had their bouquet except maybe you because you didn't have enough, you, you didn't prepare. So it was a big deal. Now five of the women waiting with the bride had brought extra oil because they knew they could be waiting a long time. If the groom's really whooping it up with his family, they might not be coming for a while. And five of the women just brought their lamps with no extra oil. And so late at night, there's a cry. The, the groom's coming. It's time. Get ready. So five of the women, they're, they're ready to go. They got extra oil. The five women that didn't prepare, don't, their lamps burn out because they've been waiting, they've been waiting. So they ask the five women that have the extra oil, hey, can, you, can I borrow some oil? And the women with the extra oil say, well, no, if, you, if we give you our oil, then, then we won't have enough. So the five women who were unprepared go to find somewhere they can find more oil. And in the meantime, the groom comes the five prepared women go with them, dancing through the streets with their lighted lamps, and into the place where the party resumes. And the door is shut. Then the five unprepared women come back. Now they've got oil. But they've been separated from the rest of the group. And the person who answers the door says, well, who are you? Everybody who's part of the party is already here. You're, you're part of the entourage? Sure. How come you weren't here with the rest of the women? You're coming late. Meh. I don't know you. Can't get in. There's some sad phrases in this story. My oil has run out. My lamp won't light. I don't know you. The door was shut. All those phrases, like the phrase, it's too late phrases that we don't want to hear. If you're applying for uh, financial aid in school and you realize you missed the deadline and they tell you, sorry, too late. Uh. But that's what happens for folks that aren't prepared. That, that's what Jesus is trying to say. Because look at how he finishes the story. Therefore, he says, summing it all up, Verse 13, therefore keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Be ready, be prepared. And how do we prepare? Well, by being faithful. And we prepare by repenting. Yes, that nasty word, repent. It's the message of John the Baptist, getting people ready for Christ's first coming. Repent. It means two things in the original language. It means to confess your sin, and the word literally means to turn. To turn and go in a new direction. Not in the same sinful direction you've been in, but to go in a different direction. Anybody here remember the movie Mr. Holland's Opus? Yeah, it was real popular. I can see that one. Okay. Come on, put your hand up. Have you seen the movie? All right. There is a scene in there. Well, first of all, real quick, the movie is about this guy who, when he's young, he always wants to write a symphony. That's his dream. He's, he's, he's a music guy, and this is what he wants to do. And he can't make money, you know, building up to that point. So he gets a job as a music teacher in a high school. It's only going to be temporary, but the years go by. He's still teaching music years later, still trying to work on his symphony. It's not really coming together. And then one year, he has a student, beautiful young woman, very talented singer. Now, by now, this teacher has got a wife, he's got a son, he's got a family, but he's unfulfilled, and he He's working with this young girl, and she's beautiful, and he feels 
drawn to her. And at one point, there's the production that they put on in the high school, and then she says to him, I'm leaving tonight on a bus to go to New York. I'm going to become a star. And she says to him, why don't you come with me? And together, we can follow our dreams. And the way the movie is produced, you, know, you, you can see him struggling. He's wrestling. Do I leave my family and go off with this beautiful young girl? Do I follow my dream of writing a symphony? And, and so the late hour comes, and he goes to the bus stop, and she's there waiting. And she's excited when she sees him come. because She's like, yes, he's coming with me. And he hands her a piece of paper, and on the piece of paper is the name and number of a friend of his in New York. And he says, call him when you get there. He'll help you. Gives her a kiss on the cheek. And he walks away. He turns. And he walks away from that temptation. That's the idea of repenting, is to walk away from sin. Now, I know as a preacher preaching to a church, many of you may be sitting here this morning and saying, well, what, you know, this, this sermon's for somebody else because I don't need to repent. I'm a Christian. In fact, I'm here just about every week. I know Jesus. I serve the Lord. But there's a sneaky sin, and it's called pride. And when pride sneaks in, it says, oh, that doesn't apply to me. It, it, it makes us fold our arms and say, well, it's, I hope they're listening, because what he's saying, they need to they wise up. And Pride sneaks in and says, I'm above that, and I don't need to hear that. Pride separates us from other people. Pride creates an exclusivity that pushes other people away, that separates groups of people. And it's sneaky because sometimes we don't even realize that we're doing it. You know, the biggest group of people that Jesus had a problem with? The Pharisees. And who were the Pharisees? The religious people of the day who thought they had their religious act together. And they didn't want to hear what Jesus had to say because they didn't think they needed it. And they were the ones that perhaps needed it most. So whatever it is that you need to turn from, whether it's a sneaky sin or it's a sin that's obvious to you, I want to say, Advent is a time to repent. It's a time to keep watch, as Jesus said. It's a time to be prepared. It's a time to realize that Christ came and he's coming back. And will he recognize you and me as being one of his own? Are we living in such a way that he'll recognize that? Are, are we living in such a way that other people recognize that we serve the Lord? Do we have a witness? Or are we ashamed or are we embarrassed? And are we so filled with ourselves and our own religiosity that we think we don't need to repent, that we don't need to ask forgiveness? That's a dangerous place to be. But I want to say, when we do repent, when we do watch, we do realize that in the midst of the decorations and the baking and the Christmas tree, there is this message of hope that Christ is real and that he's our Lord and Savior. And the good news is that when we trust in him and we come clean with him, he forgives, sets us on the right path, and we can become the people that he calls us to be. And when that happens, it's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's what the kingdom is about, and that's why Jesus told the story. Let us be among the maidens who were ready with extra oil and not those who were unprepared. And let us pray about that. Father, thank you for loving us to the point of sending Jesus. Let us not lose sight of what this season is really to be about and if there's any way in us that is not right Lord grant us grace to turn from any wicked ways any sinful ways any dark ways whatever whether it's a habit whether it's a pattern of thinking pattern of behavior show us the light and give us the strength to follow the light that this Christmas might be a great celebration of the hope and joy in life that you intend for all of us and this we ask in your name Amen. Would you stand with us as we close together singing a song? Say, come on, come on, everyone. See what he has done. He has lifted us and he has overcome. The power of the grave. That was enslaved Couldn't hold him in the ground Couldn't keep him down Rise with a shout Cry out Our God's alive Rise, holy fire Burn bright, burn bright Rise with a shout Cry out For freedom Rise, church, arise
Friends, Christ is alive. Open your hearts and minds to let him live in you and go forth to burn brightly for him. Amen.